Engraved and pecked into a sheer cliff of yellow sandstone are six human figures perched high above the valley floor. They have broad shoulders and narrow waists, and the setting sun ignites their elegant costumes of feathered headdresses, masks, antennae, pendants, and beads. With heroic demeanor, one carries a shield and displays a trophy head dangling from a staff. This panel, known as the Sun Carriers and found on the McConkey Ranch near Vernal, Utah, was created a thousand years ago by an ancient people now called Fremont. Francois Gohier came to Utah in 1991 to photograph dinosaur fossils and went away with photographs of rock art. He found inspiration in Fremont figurines at the Prehistoric Museum in Price. His idea for this book arose from his awe of Utah's ancient rock art from his contemplations on desert hikes, and from the silence and sounds of being alone in the canyons. The parietal art of the Fremont was not enough for Francois, and his exploration turned to the people who produced it. His photography followed suit, portraying everyday tools, pottery, the hide and fiber arts, and ornamentation in his pursuit of traces of Fremont. I am an archaeologist, so I visit a lot of rock art, but I have a confession to make. Most rock art is, considered alone, inscrutable. It is susceptible to ad hoc interpretation because it's disconnected from, well, from people, their behaviors, and the cultures in which they live. It is the same with fancy artifacts such as baskets, arrowheads, or pots. Sure, I get excited with the occasional spectacular find such as the ancient unstrung bow I found tucked into a ledge in Nevada years ago. And sure, upon close examination, a fine basket of the motifs on a rock art panel can be awe-inspiring unto themselves. For the most part, though, the art is empty unless I know something about the people who created it. Call me a modernist, but unless I have access, not so much to the artist, but to the cultural context of the artist, I have no way of knowing the work. This surely reveals my shortcomings as a fancier of art, but I want to suggest that the exquisite photographs of artifacts and rock art offered here as traces of Fremont is in fact a time machine of sorts. It can take us into a Fremont world inhabited by real people with real lives more than a thousand years ago. The knowledge of anthropology can make these traces come alive. The Fremont were ancient farmers of maize, beans, and squash. They began to transform in the first few centuries AD from a society that collected food by foraging to one that produced food by investing labor into the land. Fremont culture crystallized by the 6th or 7th century and populations peaked in the 10th to 12th centuries. By the 14th century, and perhaps later in a few places, historical changes transformed the Fremont into something culturally different. Our view is unobstructed as we approach the toe of a flattened ridge where the people live. The ridge fingers onto a floodplain hemmed among the sandstone walls of a canyon as unique as it is common in Utah. The trees and brush for some distance around have been cleared over the years by people living in this spot. A panel of rock art on a sunny sandstone wall at the edge of the canyon catches our eyes as if intended to do just that. The images are rows of bighorn sheep, arrangements of geometrics, and the triangular anthropomorphs typical of the Fremont. Some images are superimposed on others but the panel mostly strings along as if constructed sequentially over time. It is a reminder that the past is very much part of the present in the Fremont world and that this world is in constant renewal. 
our destination is just ahead and in this case the rock art we just passed is clearly within view of the settlement. This is a small place, one that archaeologists often call a Fremont rancheria, farmstead, or hamlet. It is the most typical form of Fremont settlement. We will soon find, however, that Fremont hamlets were dynamic segments of larger networks of settlements, some much larger. The network linking these places encompass kinship, language, symbolism, and place. These connections stretched across geography and across time and were made organic by cycles of human mobility and migration ingrained in a living landscape that was at once past and present. Rock art is one element of a Fremont social geography. It offers a glimpse of the agency of individuals who did not act alone but were instead part of the social fabric that for the Fremont included a worldview that extended beyond the household and the family. Nor is rock art just about the makers and the meaning it held for them. This is because rock art remains meaningful on time scales that transcend the lives of individuals. Indeed, the initial intent fades and the importance of the maker diminishes as future users and caretakers construct the meaning of the rock art for their own times. Rock art does not passively reflect a meaning, but is a vehicle used to construct meaning as history proceeds. The classic Bernal style is noted for its depictions of heroic figures in highly organized scenes that are clearly symbolic and strongly mythical. In a Fremont world, such depictions may have been connected to remembered events and revered ancestors, and thus seen as living history. The most famous examples of the classic Vernal style employ themes of conflict and displays of bloodshed, trophy taking, and scalping. The spectacular photographic images of rock art and fabulous objects displayed here can transport us into a facet of Fremont culture that we understand in only vague terms, their social and ideological world. Archaeologists are reluctant to write about such things, and I am old enough to remember the days when proper archaeologists did not take the study of rock art very seriously. It was seen as too speculative too difficult to understand through empirical means, and attempts at interpretation led to bloody battles, mostly because the images are subject to the vicissitudes of artistic interpretation. Archaeologists now investigate rock art, but the challenges of comprehending the ancient world of social and political organization, let alone ritual, symbolism, and cosmology, remain significant. Surely objectivity in the purest sense is a will-o'-the-wisp, but I believe that archaeology and our toolkit of anthropological analogy tell us about these things, just not in a very straightforward manner. People want to know about the life of the mind. They want to be carried into the past. They want the rest of the story. The proposition I pursued here is that to know the Fremont one must include the rock art, but to know the rock art, one must know the Fremont.